Thank you. Jaiyo Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaiyo Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Gopi Janna Vallama Hirvarendhari Jai Gopi Janna Vallama Hirvarendhari Yashoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanechari Yamuna Tira Vannachari Jaiyo Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaiyo Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vashadhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare Jayo Prabhupada, 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 Srila Prabhupada. Jayo Jayo Prabhupada, 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 Jayo Jayo Prabhupada. Jai Om Vishnu Pāt Parmaham Saparivar Jagacharya Astu Tarasata Shishi Matis Divine Grace Aishi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shila Prabhu Pāt Ki Shishi Gaur Nityai Ki Jai Shishi Radha Vallabh Ki Shri Shri Jagannath Balaja Subramai Ki Ananta Koti Vaishnava Vrindi Ki Nita Gaur Pramanande Om Namo Bhagavate Vāsudevāya Om Namo Bhagavate Vāsudevāya Om Namo Bhagavate Vāsudevāya Hare Krishna Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Kento 5, Chapter number 2 Text number 4, 5.2.4. Just open this. It's a very, very long uh, a verse, Sanskrit verse, with a different meter. Uh, so I've tried to break it down so I can sing it in the <laughs> Brahma Samhita tune. Let's see how we go. <clears throat> Sachatad ashramo pavanam atiram maniyam. Vivida nibhida vitapi vitapa nikara sam slista. Purata lata rudha sthala vihangama mitunai. Mitunai Prochyamana Sruti Bhir Prati Bhodhyamana Salila Kukkuta Karandava Kalaham Sadi Bhir Vichitaram Upakujita Mala Jalasaya Kamala Karam Upapa Brahma You want to try out? Sachatad Ashramo Pavanam Atiram Maniyam Vidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidhidh
विविध निभिध विटपि विटप निकर संश्लिष्टा पुरट लथारूध स्थल मिथुन प्रोच्यम श्रुतिभिर्प्रतिबोध्यम सलिलकुकुटकारलहम सदिर्विचितर उपकूजित जलसया कमलाक उपब्राह्मा थैंक यू वेरी डिफिकल्ट So very, I, and I don't think that's even the right meter to be honest. Uh, but we made it. Sa, she, purva chitti, cha. Now sorry, let's restart. Sa, she, which is purva chitti. Cha, also. Tat, of Maharaj Agnidhara. Ashrama, of the place of meditation. Upavanam, the park. Ati, very. Ramaniyam, beautiful. Vivida, varieties of. Nibida, dense. Vitapi, trees. Vitapa, of branches and twigs. Nikara, messes. Samslista, at, attached. Purata, Golden, Lata, with creepers, Arudha, going high, Istala Vihangama, of land birds, Mithunai, with pears, Prochemana, vibrating, Srutibhir, pleasing sounds, Pratibhodhyamana, responding, Salilakukkuta, waterfall, Karandhava, ducks, Kalahamsa, with various kinds of swans, Adibhi, and so on, Vichitram, variegated, Upakujita, resounding with the vibration, Amla, clear, Jalasya, in the lake, Kamalakaram, the source of lotus flowers. Upa Brahma began to walk in. Translation in Pop. No, well, there's no Pope. Translation by Shri Prabhupada. Ki. The Apsara sent by Lord Brahma began strolling in a beautiful park near the place where the king was meditating and worshipping. The park was beautiful because of its dense green foliage and golden creepers. There were pairs of varied birds such as peacocks and in the lake there were ducks and swans, all vibrating with sweet sounds. Thus the park was magnificently beautiful because of the foliage, the clear water, the lotus flower and the sweet singing various kinds of birds. No? There is no purport, so we'll read the next one as well. Just read that out. Tasya sululita gamana padavinyayasa gati vilayas chanupadam khana khana yamana ruchira charana bharana swanam upakaranya naradeva kumara samadhi yogena militi nayana nalina mukula yugalam ishad vikachaya vyachastha Translation Espurvati, Espurvachiti passed by on the road in a very beautiful style and mood of her own, the pleasing ornaments of her ankles tinkled with her every step. Although Prince Agnidhara was controlling his senses, practicing yoga with half-opened eyes, he could see her with his lotus-like eyes. And when he heard the sweet tinkling of her bangles, he opened his eyes slightly more 
and could see that she was just nearby. Hmm? Let's read the purport. Again, long purport. It is said that yogis always think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead with great hearts. Dhyana navastita targate na manasa pasyantiyam yoginaha. Bhagavatam 12.13.1. 12.13.1. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is, is always observed by yogis who practice controlling the venomous senses. As recommended in Bhagavad Gita, yogis should practice some preksya nashigram, keeping half eyes half keeping their eyes half open. If the eyes are complete closed completely, there will be tendency to sleep. So-called yogis sometimes practice a fashionable form of yoga by closing their eyes and meditating. But we have actually seen such so-called yogis sleeping and snoring while meditating. This is not the practice of yoga. To actually practice yoga, one should keep his eyes half open and gaze at the tip of his nose. It's a long purport, so you know, we'll just break it there. Just the synopsis of that is Prabhupada is saying that yogis try to control their senses and the, the, for this is the Astanga Yogis, and the best way and the right way to do it is by having your eyes half closed, half open. Other than that, if it's fully closed, they will doze off to sleep. And this is just Astanga Yogas, yeah? Next. Although Agnidhara, the son of Priyavrata, was practicing mystic yoga and trying to control his senses, the tinkled sound of Purvachitti attacked at ankle, Purvachitti's ankle, Bells disturbed his practice. Yoga Indriya Sayamya. Actual yoga practice means controlling the senses. One must practice mystic yoga to control the senses, but the sense control of a devotee who fully engages in the service of the Lord with his purified senses, Rishikena Rishikesha Sevanam, can never be disturbed. Srila Prabhupada Saraswati therefore stated. Durdayandindriya kala sarpa patali prokahata damstra yate chaitanya charita mirta 5. The practice of yoga is undoubtedly good because it controls the senses which are like venomous serpents. Hmm? So Prabhupada so far has explained that for Ashtanga yogi, hmm, he tries to control his senses, whereas for the devotee, controlling the senses becomes very easy because he is engaging in senses in the service of the Lord. The practice of yoga is undoubtedly good because it controls the senses, which are like venomous serpents. When one engages in devotional service, however, completely employing all the activities of the senses in the service of the Lord, the venomous quality of the senses is completely nullified. It is explained that a serpent is to be feared because of its poisonous fangs. But if those fangs are broken, the serpent, although it seems fearsome, is not at all dangerous. Hmm? So Prabhupada now says that, gives, after explaining that devotees controlling their senses is easy for them, and he gives the analogy of the serpent, that if the serpent's fangs are chopped off, then the, you know, it will not have poisonous effect on us. Devo Next, continues, Lord Prabhupada continues. Devotees therefore may, be, may see hundreds and thousands of beautiful women with fascinating bodily movements and gestures but not be allured, whereas such women would make ordinary yogis fall. Even the advanced yogi Vishwamitra broke his mystic practice to unite with Menaka and be beget a child known as Sakuntala. The practice of mystic yoga, therefore, is not sufficiently strong to control the senses. So Prabhupada says that the practice of Ashtanga yoga is nice, but it is not strong enough medicine for us to control our senses. Another example is Prince Agnidhara, whose attention, and then Prabhupada gives the example of this particular verse, because we are talking about Agnidhara, Prabhupada writes. Another example is Prince Agnidhara, whose attention was drawn to the movements of Purvachiti, the Apsara, simply because he heard the tinkling of her ankle bells. In the same way that Vishwamitra Muni was attracted by the tinkling bangles of Meneka, Prince Agnidhara, upon hearing the tinkling bangles of Purvachiti, immediately opened his eyes to see her beautiful movements as she walked. The prince was also very handsome. As described herein, his eyes were just like the buds of lotus flowers. As he opened his lotus-like eyes, he could immediately see that the Apsara was present by his side. Om Jnanandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya 
चक्षुरुन मिलित तस्म श्री गुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण प्रेस्थाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नितीनामिने नमस्ते सरस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यादेशिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैता गदाधार श्रीवासदी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे हरे सो इन दिस सेक्शन व्हाट वी आर सीइंग is that uh, hmm? generally you now in english you know there are these terminologies like you know he's got a good sense of humor hmm? or he's got a good sense of control he's got a good he or she has got a good sense of purpose so sometimes you know this word sense gets put in front of hmm? another verb you know as an adjective uh, to explain you know to to bring out some meanings good sense so here what we are seeing is that the the prince agnidhara you know is attracted to the sense of beauty the beauty of purvachitti you know who is strolling in the park beautiful park explained here when the prince is meditating uh disturbs his meditation and is immediately attracted to the beauty hmm? and then subsequently you know in the next few verses we'll see that he starts flattering her around you know and then gets very very attached to her hmm? so in the bhagavad gita krishna tells us that dhyato vishyan pumsa sangatya shopa jayate hmm? that if we meditate on the sense object which is the tan matras if we meditate on the sense object dhyat dhyato then we get attached sangasthe shopa jayate then we get attached to the sense object now here actually you know, the situation is much more worse than that hmm? because there when krishna is talking about the dhyato vishayan pumsa if you meditate on a sense object you will get attached to it here actually if you see what prince agnidhara is doing he is not meditating on the sense object actually he is meditating on something else he is doing ashtanga yoga so his meditation is something else completely he is meditating on lord brahma if i am not mistaken you know because that's what whom he is worshiping at the moment doing ashtanga yoga so when he is when he is even not meditating on the sense object but meditating on somebody else still just by hearing the tinkle of the ankle bells of this beautiful girl his sadhana breaks you know his meditation breaks and he gets attached you know and the rest is pretty much you know he's gone gone case you know? uh so so we can see you know how how much when when somebody who is meditating not meditating on the sense object but something higher can get so easily distracted no and let's say fall down then what are the consequences of those and us <laughs> who actually do go ahead and meditate on the sense object no then the detachment is just too far out you know it just becomes way too difficult so yes no maharaj parikshit no allowed kaliyuga to walk in in his kingdom because being a devotee he saw the good in kaliyuga hmm? what was the good in kaliyuga that he saw that just by thinking of something good the kaliyuga its will get benefit but if they think of something bad they will not get the reaction hmm? so just by thinking we can accumulate so much of you know pious credits just by thinking that's the beauty of kaliyuga so maharaj parikshit allowed him in his kingdom otherwise there was no chance so here you know because kaliyuga has got that you know by so 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 if we meditate on the sense objects then oh, although we don't get you know let's say the reactions of it but it can attach us but when when sangha happens then we are gone you know so so we have to be very very careful is the point that prabhupad uh, was emphasizing in his purpose you know uh, to be very very careful so before we discuss little bit more about you know agnidhara and purvachitti hmm, i just wanted to because this is chapter 2 of canto 5 we have just you now begun chapter canto 5 and and certainly this is my first lecture on canto 5 you know in the temple now 
So I just wanted to quickly, because who is this Agnidhara that we are talking about? And who is this Purvachitti? Where did Agnidhara come from? You know, what is the what is the context, you know, what is the flow of the Bhagavatam to bring us to this point in time? And, and generally, you know, when, when we are starting this canto, I thought this was a good time to, you know, uh, recapitulate, uh, uh, re recap, you know, what, what is happening. A and then I wanted to go back to canto 4, because that's, of course, where the storyline will build up. Uh, and then I went back to canto 3 in my mind. And then I went back to canto 2 and then canto 1. So, so, you know, we'll start from Canto 1 only, and today's, you know, uh, major, majority of the time I'll be speak, speaking about, you know, the four Cantos of Bhagavatam, building up to Canto 5, and then, you know, a little bit about Agnidhara and Purvachitti at the back end, you know, uh, for the next, for the few minutes at the end. Hmm? So, if we start Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, from Canto 1, hmm, what happens in Bhagavatam that Bhagavatam is, you know, uh, compared uh, to the beautiful, you know, uh, form of the Lord Himself, uh, just as we take Darshan of the Lord from the from His lotus feet, you know, up to His smiley face. Similarly, you know, we read Bhagavatam Prabhupada said also in that particular order from Kanto one, Kanto two onwards, so that we are taking the proper darshan of the Bhagavatam, which is called darshan padditi. Hmm? So Kanto one and Kanto two talks mainly about introduction to Bhagavatam. Hmm? There are ten subject matters in Bhagavatam, which we will discuss shortly. But Kanto one and Kanto two mainly talk about introduction to Bhagavatam with little bit brief description about Sarga and Visarga, generally, you know, towards the back end of Canto 2. No? Uh, but mainly about the introduction to many, many things. What does it introduce? Uh, in Canto 1, no? the, uh, who are the main characters? Hmm? Who are the main speakers in the Bhagavatam? Who are the main characters? Hmm? Main personalities. So who are the main speakers? As we know, Bhagavatam is very con nested conversation. So it starts with Sutta Goswami speaking to the sages of Naimisharanya. Then we also know that that is a subset of a bigger discussion that was happening between Sukhdeva Goswami and Parikshit Maharaj. Then we know that is a bigger discussion, uh, you know, that Sukhdeva Goswami got the transcendental knowledge from Vyasadev. Vyasadev got it from Narad Muni. Narad Muni got it from Lord Brahma. Brahma got it from Lord Vishnu, Krishna himself, you know. So that's the parampara. We get introduced to all these different speakers, different characters, hmm? uh, different personalities, exalted personalities, such as uh, uh, Kunti Maharani hmm? and what does she want in the Bhagavatam? She wants, you know, that Vipada, you know, that tribulation should keep coming in her mind, in her life, so that she can think of Krishna more and more. Dhyan, again, you know, meditate on Krishna. Here we can see how meditation is broken so easily by the attraction of the opposite sex. So devotees want to meditate on the Lord so that we are not uh, mesmerized, you know, by the material glamour. So she wants to meditate on the Lord and therefore she asks for more vipada, more tribulation, so she can think of the Lord. We get introduced to you know, Bhishma Dev hmm? uh, when he is about to leave his body. What does Bhishma Dev say? Oh my Lord, let me now meditate on your beautiful form so that I can leave my body. Hmm? Now that you are present before me, let me meditate. Close my eyes and meditate on your pastimes and your form and I will leave my body. So that's Bhishma Dev gets introduced. Then we get introduced to Sukhdev Goswami. So, so Kunti Maharani offers a beautiful prayers in Kanto 1. Uh, Bhishma Dev offers his beautiful prayers in Kanto 1. Then we get introduced to Sukhdev Goswami in Kanto 2, you know, who starts answering Maharaj Parikshit's question. And Sukhdev Goswami offers his beautiful prayers in Kanto 2 of Bhagavatam. You know, amazing prayers about uh, paying obeisances to the Lord and asking, for, asking the Lord for his mercy. So he does that so that he can answer Maharaj Pariksit's question, you know, authoritatively and in the proper parampara. So he offers his prayers to uh, Krishna, hmm? so like that. But amongst all these personalities and all these characters introduced in the first two candles of Bhagavatam, one thing is categorically clear right from the beginning. And what is that? Ete cha amsa kala pumsa, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. Hmm? Ete cha amsa kala pumsa. So Krishna has got amsa and he has got kala. So the Amsar is his plenary expansions and Kala are his expansions of the expansions. So Krishna is the, and Krishna is to Bhagavan Swam, that you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So you are the Avatari and all your other expansion and expansions of the expansions are your uh, Kala and are your Amsar and are your Kalas. You know? So Krishna gets categorically established as the Supreme Personality of Godhead amongst all these exalted personalities like, you know, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva and Vyasa, Dev, Narad Muni, all are introduced. But Krishna is, you know, right from the center, you know, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then, uh, 
then what also gets very you know uh, quickly established apart from establishment of krishna as the supreme personality of godhead what also gets very quickly established is that amongst all the processes and the various paths of transcendence bhakti yoga is the supreme the supremacy of bhakti is very quickly uh, articulated by sukhdev goswami to maharaj parikshit no at the beginning of canto 2 because maharaj parikshit's question fundamental question was what what is the duty of somebody who is at any point in time especially of a person who is about to die so sukhdev and knowing that there was an urgency in maharaj parikshit's question because he is going to leave his body in 7 days time then sukhdev goswami immediately tells him the answer that it is hare naam anu kirtanam but there he also says that what are the other processes certainly he says that grihamedi life is a waste of time don't do grihamedi life reject that immediately then he says that demigod worships why do people do demigod worships is because they want some material opulence such as a nice house nice car nice son nice wife you know nice job nice education these are the what people want from demigods reject that you know why do you have to do all that when one can just live a very simple life you can use your hands as your pillows you can sleep on the floor you know you can eat just fruits and nuts why do we need all these complications at worshiping demigods so you know dismantle then he says of the other yoga processes you know if somebody is doing ashtanga yoga then he says well okay there is a bona fide process albeit it's very slow it will take you you know longer time to reach the supreme personality of godhead and there could be fall downs just like we can see here in case of agnidhara there can be fall downs and plus you are endeavoring on your own without the mercy of the lord it's your own personal solo endeavor hmm? because it's ashtanga yoga the supremacy of bhakti gets established to say if you do bhakti yoga you your endeavor is only your sincerity hmm? and the mercy of the lord will do the rest of the magic hmm? so do bhakti that's how it gets established then maharaj parikshit uh, parikshit asks about the process of creation of the material universe how does it get created then sukhdev goswami tells him actually how it created creates you know lord vishnu expands as karna daksha vishnu to garbha daksha vishnu to shira daksha vishnu to you know to the virat rupa and then how the different elements are contributed you know right from lord vishnu glancing at pradhan which gets activated and becomes mahatattva then the you know the bhumi apna lo vayo kham manu buddhi re vacha all these elements are introduced and then the creation starts hmm? so right towards the end then of canto 2 um, we hear the chatur shloki bhagavatam from lord vishnu you know who is giving the vedic wisdom to lord brahma uh, because narad narad muni has asked some parishit maharaj has asked some questions of sukhdev goswami which are similar in nature to the questions that narad muni is asking Uh, lord brahma which are similar in nature to what lord brahma had asked lord vishnu at the beginning of creation hmm? so when when these questions are asked when maharaj parikshit is asking this question we can see how sukhdev goswami answers these questions by reference to the discussion between lord vishnu and lord brahma why because that is the parampara parampara means to quote authorities to answer the question not according to our own whims no so immediately and especially if the question is about how this material world was created well it is best to hear from the, the the secondary creator himself which is lord brahma rather than me trying to articulate you uh, know articulate so he refers to that discussion you know? so they are you know, lord brahma also asks the lord vishnu four fundamental questions you know about you know what are the forms of you lord, my lord what are your different forms what are your different energies what are your different activities and how can i save you without becoming proud so in response to these four questions Lord Vishnu gives Lord Brahma the Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam in chapter nine of Kanto two. Hmm? Then Kanto ten ends with you know the uh, the ten subject matters of Shri Mad Bhagavatam. Atro Sarga Vi Atro Sarga Vi Sargas Cha Istanam Poshanam Utaya Manvantre Chanu Katha Nirodha Muktir Ashraya. No, so ten subject matters of Bhagavatam are introduced. which are elaborated from the four verses that lord vishnu gave to lord brahma from the chatur shloki we expand into the 10 subject matters of the shrimad bhagavatam and this 10 subject matters are given the nine are given only for the purpose to reach the 10th one which is ashraya which is taking shelter ashraya means shelter taking shelter of krishna the nine other subjects are given you know so where are this 10 subject matters found in shrimad bhagavatam they are found throughout shrimad bhagavatam all 10 subject matters are found throughout shrimad bhagavatam having said that some subject matters hmm, are primarily discussed more in some cantos compared to the other 
So that is why Acharyas have told us you know, that, uh, that they have dissected the Kentos into different, different subject matters. For example, Kento 1 and 2 introduces its introduction to Bhagavatam with, with a brief description about Sarga and Visarga. Kento 3 and 4 are primarily about Sarga and Visarga. And then what we are reading now, Kento 5, is about Isthana or about the, uh, the geographical you know, locations and placements of the material universe. That's where we are. Kento 10 talks about Ashraya, you know, which is the smiley face of the Lord. 11 talks about uh, Muktir, which is liberation. And 12 talks about Nirodha, which is annihilation of this material world. So like that. So, so in, in, in third Kento, we see primarily the discussions is you know, Maitreya Muni telling Uddhava about the Sarga and Visarga of the material world. No, how it was created. Now, Kento 4 is beautiful. Hmm? Kento 4 <laughs> is very, very beautiful because, uh, I mean, all the Kentos are beautiful, but why I say, you know, it is, it is almost like a repository for us in one sense because we can learn from the amazing activities and the not so amazing activities of the others. So, no, they are pastimes narrated of almost like a good, the good cop and the bad cop, you no? Know? The good character and a bad character comes out in these discussions in Kento 4, from which we can learn the good virtues of those some personalities and the vices from the other. And they are full of it. It's like you know, chapter after chapter, you know, we, we go through these amazing pastimes, you no? Know? Uh, or not pastimes, amazing narrations of this great, uh, of these personalities. What are some of them, just to bring it to light? You no, know? in, uh, in Kento 4, for example, you no, know, we start with or well, not necessarily start with, but in any particular order, no? we see um, uh, the event of Lord Daksha and Lord Shiva. Hmm? What do we learn from, uh, uh, f uh, not Lord Daksha, event of Daksha and Lord Shiva. What do we learn from Daksha's characters? Hmm? Uh, how not to be proud? Hmm? Because he was proud of his achievements, you know, and, uh, and, and because of that he demanded respect from everybody in the assembly. And Prabhupada told us that we don't demand respect, we, no, we command respect. No? If our characters are fine, people will respect us, but otherwise, you know, we don't go around demanding respect. So here, Daksha was uh, demanding respect from others, including Lord Shiva. So Lord, Lord Shiva was meditating at that point in time, and he didn't stand up when Daksha entered the assembly. So Daksha took it as that Lord Shiva is very offensive to me, you know? and, and then he started you know, using foul language there, you know. So, so uh, notwithstanding the provocation by Daksha, uh, what was the reaction of Lord Shiva? Uh, we learn how to be tolerant when we are provoked. Lord Shiva didn't even speak a single word, just heard what Daksha said and stood up and left the assembly. Super tolerance, you know. This shows that when we are agitated by somebody, if we can move away from the scene, it will be for our benefit. Sometimes corrections has to be made, that is true, you know, tolerance is not the only virtue. Tolerance has to be balanced with the virtue of justice, that is there. But justice, you know, and, and, uh, and correction are not the first reaction, you know, when we are provoked, you know. We try to tolerate. Tamasthi tikshashwa bharata, you know, Krishna tells Arjuna. So we tolerate as much as possible. You know? So Lord uh, Shiva tolerates here, you know, the, the, the annoyance that he got from Daksha. You know? So, 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 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also tells, you know, that mana apamana bhayo. Hmm? No, whether, we, whether we are, man means respect, you know, whether we are respected or we are disrespected, disrespected, we should be equipoised in both situations, you know. Not that, you know, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we are happy when we are respected and we are unhappy when we are disrespected. Because then what will happen, that our, that our disposition is then dependent on somebody else, else's reaction to us. That is the problem in being happy or not happy depending on somebody else's reaction. We are, t we are pivoting our, reaction, our, our happiness on somebody else and that's a problem because that somebody else will someday respect us and someday not respect us. It's guaranteed. You know? So if we live a life of dependence on any other living entity except for Krishna, then we are in trouble always. You know? We are uh, shakeable. So he says, you know, that mana apamana bhayo, be stable, be a sthita dhara, no? be, be, be firm, be, be stable. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu takes it to another level altogether. No? What does he say? Amani na mana deva. Hmm? <laughs> Amani na mana deva. Amani, for yourself 
don't expect any respect but manya dena give respect to others regardless of who they are so this is another high level you know mani na manya deva kirtanya sada hari so this is what we learn from lord shiva daksha uh, situation another thing that we learn you know by corroborating with another pastime is uh, in lord ram's pastime just the night before coronation when it was declared you know by maharaj dasarath that lord ram will be coronated as the king of ayodhya the next morning everybody was absolutely jubilant hmm? uh, uh, the day before the coronation you know that all the arrangements for the yagya and everything else was being set up you know everybody was happy but on the night before the coronation when mother kk asked for the two boons you know in lord ram had to be exiled to the forest so before the exilement what are the reactions hmm? before the announcement that lord ram will be not the king and exiled everybody including lakshman you no know, is jubilant because you no know, my elder brother who is my worshipable lord will be coronated as the king so everybody is happy including lakshman but when the news spreads you no know, that, that due to some conspiracy you now the lord ram is to leave ayodhya and bharat will be the king lakshman is furious absolutely furious and in his fury he says that no i am going to take revenge from my, my our father maharaj dasarath and 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 punish kk you no know, uh, for this absolute horrendous uh, demands you no know? this is not own you no know? i'm um, if need be we will do a mutiny you no know? and we will do a coup on this government and take over and i will install you as the rightful king i'm not going to let this happen you no know? so he's furious and therein lord ram teaches to us this very very valuable lesson similar to what we have been talking so far what does he say lakshman till yesterday you said that this is that our father is the best father <laughs> our mother kk is the best mother our father is the best father because you know at, at this a stage when he could have continued to be the king is retiring as the king and bestowing and, and coronating you as the king he is the best in the world today you are saying he is the worst in the world what has happened what has changed why why are you furious now why what has changed all of us are and lakshman this is what La- lord ram is you know asking lakshman to teach us a lesson what has changed all of us are and what has actually changed lakshman has changed then is furious just because somebody else has changed ever is lord ram who is the maryada purushottam no who is the uh, is the epitome of all fantastic beautiful virtues and characters maryada no doesn't shake at all because he is who he is not that he has also become furious because somebody else has been trying to take away his possessions so he says no lakshman this is not how we react when tribulations come in life we have to be stable be who you are don't be somebody that somebody else wants you to be then you will be in trouble so beautiful so beautiful no so tolerate and be firm and be stable and what brings our stability on all this is our devotion no good good qualities makes us stable let's continue what are the other events in canto 4 hmm? we see the we see the past time of uh, lord dhruva with suniti with surichi with utanapad with narad muni hmm? and dhruva that makes it five dhruva suniti surichi utanapad and narad muni now what are the reactions hmm? when surichi you no know, she uh, again you know uh, disrespects or uh, even chastises dhruva hmm? uh, with uh, with harsh words harsh words saying that you are not eligible to sit on the you know on the lap of your father this just dhruva being a kshatriya by nature burns him up to say oh my god you can talk to me like this being not fit standing he was a small boy he said i'm going to take vengeance i'm in a vengeance mood i will take revenge so he asked etc etc so we see that we should not speak harshly like suruchi suruchi ruchi means attachment and su means too much so suruchi is somebody who is too attached to her husband utanapad and also to the kingdom that she can't even see anybody else you know taking any share and pleasure in the kingdom so we you know we should not be so attached to the material opulence including the husband or the wife you know so so that's what we learn from suruchi 
from suniti who is the you know the, the, the devotee mother of dhruva what do, what do we learn she teaches dhruva to be patient be patient utsaha nishche dhairyat no be patient no what is your rightful claim will come to you but if you want to uh, cool down let's say you know <laughs> if you want to figure out why these things are happening to you bad things happen to good people then you know you go and meditate on lord vishnu no so how nicely you know she's preaching to her own child and generally why this is why this is so you know, uh, why this is so important and outstanding because when kids are spoken harshly especially you know when children are spoken harshly i'm just generalizing but i could be wrong here you know, mother's reaction and father's reaction are different we we see in our you know, let's say in our devotee congregation when you know when somebody's children are you know let's say ill treated by another devotee and the child goes and tells his mother generally the mother's reaction will be how dare they spoke to my son like this how dare they did this to you you know or even when children are playing and one child pushes another child you know or hates another child like that and the child you know 5 6 7 year old you know goes to the mother crying to say by the way you know that boy pushed me you know and i got we were playing and mother is like, i'm going to talk to his mother they should fix him up because why do they do this to my child my child is here you know so mothers are you know, attached to the children so they emotionally react like that but when the same child goes to the father and says you know that i got pushed by my friend and i'm hurt what does the father say hey toughen up man be a man you know be a boy toughen up be strong that's what the father will say he will not say you know go and punch him and all that you know it's like just toughen up might you know be a man you know like that so the reactions are different mothers are generally more emotionally driven yeah but suniti uh, is completely different you know she doesn't say let's just do something and accumulate some weapons on some astra siddhis and we'll take revenge on suruchi not like that not like that very very passionate very very passionate and coolly telling dhruva to accept that is as our reaction there's a will of the lord perform devotional service and everything will be all right hmm? and then we know dhruva goes and does his you know uh, dhyan dhruva also does dhyan you know what's the difference between dhruva's dhyan on the supreme personality of godhead after being inspired by narad muni compared to the dhyan of agni dhara here hmm? agni dhara is also doing dhyan you know meditation but just by the tinkle of the ankle bells of purva chitti he goes bro- breaks his sadhana and goes away and where does he go he go and he goes and marries her you know and then starts his own progeny whereas dhruva who is approaching the lord with an inferior uh, uh, desire of wanting you know a palace that is not just better than the palace of utanapad but actually a palace that is even better than the palace of lord brahma lord brahma is the secondary creator he's got all the wealth in the world you know that's all project is his so he wants a palace that is even better than him no this is too much no just to take that small revenge but through the process of devotional service his desires gets purified by the supreme lord krishna says a kama sarva kama va moksha kama udhardi whether you have any kama you come to me and i'll fix you up so here dhruva's spiritual uh, material desires gets transformed into a spiritual desire and then when lord vishnu gives him the boon you know what do you want he says i was looking for a broken piece of glass now this is interesting no what does dhruva teach us he was looking for a palace that was higher than the palace of lord brahma but he contrast that thing that he was wanting which is higher than the palace of lord brahma as not pieces as not glass he doesn't compare it to glass he compares it to broken pieces of glass <laughs> that is almost like a extreme contrast now from one to the other because in kaliyuga when you see you know rich people generally their houses will be no lot of glasses no they will have no penthouse it is called you know the top layers of the you know, tall apartment you know the penthouses they will have that as their house as their palace so that they can get the 360 view of the you know of see one side and the hill next side and the city that side everything so you no know, glasses so even glasses are useful <laughs> and that is what they desire this is almost like dhruva's mentality you know i want a palace that is surrounded by glass even you know when you walk on uh, <clears throat> st gilda beach on that beacons field parade you keep riding you know all the way to brighton you will see so many houses in the front of the house is all glasses only you know people want that view you know this is what dhruva wanted 
not so much for the view but for the revenge <laughs> but dhruva says this was nothing not only glass but this is oh my lord broken piece of glass useless completely useless i don't want this he didn't get no he didn't get disturbed by any other material allurement whereas here agnidhara is completely gone what do we learn from the past times of uh, from the teachings of narad muni no narad muni is not only in dhruva past time but in so many past times he comes and gives devotional service and we you know in iskon you know, our we are a preaching movement so all of us preach and some of us are front line preachers you know so very very important you know i had this you know so i'm going to repeat this you know the the t's of a preacher the letter t the five or six t's of a preacher you know what are they a transparent transmission of transcendental topics a transparent transmission of transcendental topics will bring about the transformation we in the heart of the jiva which will remove his tribulations a transparent transmission of transcendental topics will remove will will bring out the transformations which will remove his tribulations you know so very very important to preach transparently about transcendental topics not about coronavirus not about you know footy or cricket or something you know mix masala no transcendental topics are so, uh, related to the lord and that will transform so hearing transforms the person krishna enters the heart through the ears through the sound vibration cleanses the heart and then devotee never leaves the lotus feet of the lord when he is purified so so many pastimes in canto 4 yeah there is more but i'm going to park hmm? uh, because i want to get to canto 5 now where we, where we are you know canto 5 is the sthana you know topic of the shrimad bhagavatam which is compared to his navel you know in here we talk about <coughs> uh Uh, the 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 sthana part of the of the bhagavatam is said no the the uh, atra sarga visarga at, atra sarga visargascha sthanam poshana you know so we are at that level here we see that in canto 4 maitreya muni was telling uddhava amongst other things the descendants of manu and so bhuva manu in this particular episode na the descendants and in that he said that one of the so sambhava manu had uh, four ch- uh, five children hmm? devahuti akuti Pr- uh, prasuti three daughters and two sons uttana pad and uh, priyavrata so there when he was talking about when he spoke about the five children and he spoke about uttana pad it was not so much about to glorify or narrate about uttana pad it was more so after quickly describing who utana pad is he can get to this beautiful episode of uh, dhruva okay, that's what he wants to narrate na so that's why he starts so after explaining all that now maitreya muni continues with the past times of the other son of swayambhuva manu who is priyavrata and in chapter 1 of canto 5 which we have finished reading now uh we have spoken about we have seen the past the the, the episode of the narrations about priyavrata who he was you know, that he did lot of sacrifice as well uh, you know being subservient to the to the instructions of lord brahma he gave us his own personal plans to retire so now we are talking about the first son of king priyavrata who is agnidhara he had 13 sons from memory you know uh, three of them took took renunciation uh and three were daughters i think and seven of them he he gave the he divided the the the, the world into three, into seven islands and gave each of them to each of the seven sons and one of the sons is agnidhara who got the uh, bhumandala as his area of ruling so that's why canto 5 is all about uh, a lot about bhumandala the sarga you know the, the creation the sthanam of the bhumandala so so what is agnidhara doing that takes us to that section now no we are seeing uh, agnidhara meditating now what we just read at the beginning you know that agnidhara is meditating doing ashtanga yoga and because of you know lord brahma sending this apsara damsel uh, his meditation is broken why not because he was meditating on this beautiful girl but he was meditating on some higher principles but because of the hearing of the tinkle of the ankle bells of this beautiful charming lady his uh, his his sadhana got immediately abrupted you know and then uh, and then he started getting attached to this girl and flattering her and finally marrying her you no know? so 
we can see here what we can learn is the power of Maya when it comes to the opposite sex. The very, very strong power of Maya when we can see it the, you know, when in, in the context of the opposite sex. Why? How? Just because of the tinkle of the ankle bell, he is gone. No? There's, a, there's a rhyme, you know, which is tinkle, tinkle, little is the how I wonder how, what, what, what you are. So tinkle, tinkle, little is the, you know, how I wonder what you are. And children get attracted to the tinkling of these little, little stars. And we know they are not little stars. You know, the children on the stars will be singing, tinkle, tinkle, little earth, how I wonder how significant you are, how insignificant you are, you know. So we are insignificant compared to the stars. But anyway, the tinkling of the, twinkling of the little, little stars is very, very attractive to the children. And here in uh, Agnidhara's situation, you know, it is like, tinkle, tinkle, little bells, how I wonder who you are. <laughs> who you are that is attract so attractive to me, you know, I want to know. So this tinkling can lead to the fall down. It's just amazing power of Maya. Hmm? So when it comes to senses, and I'll start concluding now, hmm? when it comes to senses, you know, senses are very strong. It can be allured to the glamour of the material world very, very quickly, especially when it comes to the opposite sex, you know, very, very strong. Hmm? So what can we do? We can do two things with our senses. One, we can be controlled by our senses, hmm? or two, we can control our senses. Now, when we co this we know, you know, we have heard this many times, we can be controlled by our senses or we can control our senses. When we control our senses, there can be two steps. So firstly, we can curb our senses. Secondly, we can conquer our senses. And there's a difference, you know, that's why I want to just no, uh, speak about this for a few minutes. So, being conquered by the senses is gone case, which is here, you know, Agni Dhara, and majority of the human population at the moment, and animal population as well, I guess, you know, because they also get attracted. How do we control the senses? No, we can curb it or we can conquer it. No? What does curbing and conquering mean? Curbing means that I'm not, I've not been able to control my senses, but I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm struggling, but I'm trying. And I'm almost like forcefully withdrawing my senses from the sense objects, you know. For example, you know, if, uh, you know, if somebody gives me sweets at the moment, you know, I say that I, I'm fasting from sweets because it is, I've just taken a vrat for Purushottam month, Purushottam month that I will not take sweets. So I, I, I don't eat it. But if somebody offers the sweets, my reactions are, I'm fasting from sweets because it's Purushottam month. And that's all. And now this is curbing the senses. Because if somebody does put the gulab jamun in the front, it's like, you know, it's like, oh my Krishna, you know, gulab jamun. Only if it was not Purushottam month, you know, <laughs> only when the month is over, then I can just gobble those five gulab jamuns in five seconds, you know, that would be the reaction. So this is curbing by force, almost like by force, yeah, something. Whereas conquering the senses will be whether you put five gulab jamuns and, you know, and three containers of ice cream with some jalebis and laddus and whatever else. No, I'm just, I don't like sweets. No, I don't want sweets. It's like I'm indifferent. No? Out of sight or out of mind or in, uh, in sight but still out of mind. Either way, I'm just not attracted. So this is called conquering. No? We conquer. So, Prabhupada, you know, there was an instance that comes to mind. When Prabhupada, when Sri Prabhupada was in Delhi in the early days, you know, doing the Pandal programs, 10,000, you know, people you know, assembled in Delhi for the programs. So as he was walking back, or as he was walking to this stage, one or the other, as he was walking, you know, thousands of people were paying dandavats to him. And at one time, Sri Prabhupada said to one of the disciples, he said, you know why they are paying dandavats to me? Very, very, you know, profound statement he made. He said, you know why people are, you know, you know why all these people, and they were not devotees by the way, you know, they were just Indians, you know, from, you know, whoever just come to hear the katha. So, you know, he said, you know why they are paying dandavats to me? Prabhupada said, because I don't have any attraction to women, you no? Know? I don't have any sexual desires, you no, know, something like that. I don't have any attraction to the opposite sex, and that's why they are paying dandavats to me. So, what does it teach us? That when our heart is clean, our quality will shine. And you no, know, people will respect us. Amani na amani deva is good, but people will automatically respect you. you know? So like that. So that is called that is that stage is conquering the senses now. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, whether you know something is attractive or not attractive to me, 
I'm just equipoised in all cases. So the force is, you know, of controlling the senses, or of, of being controlled by the senses, or controlling the senses, or curbing the senses, or conquering the senses. You know, some of the things that we can use is to est to estimate where we sit. Now, then, the last point I wanted to make is that a lot of time our senses in our scriptures are compared to animals. Hmm? Animals, at least two that I could think of. I'm sure there would be more. You know, and one Prabhupada writes here anyway. You know. Our senses are compared to animals to give us an analogy of how we can deal with this uh, rascal senses, which is always running towards something for sensual enjoyment. Hmm? First one is horse. Hmm? In that famous chariot example, you know, when the, when, the, when the different parts of the chariot are compared to the different parts uh, of, the, of the person. If I can get this right, the chariot is compared to the body, hmm? the passenger is the soul, the intelligence is the charioteer, the reins of the horses are the mind, and the horses themselves are the senses. Hmm? So they are in there, the, no, what is explained, if the, if the horses are unbridled, then they will run wherever they want to run, especially if there are four, five horses in the chariot, yeah? and we have got five senses. So they will run and create havoc in our life. Hmm? So if the senses are bridled, which is the bridled horse, then, then only the horses will take the passenger, which is the soul, to its desired destination. So Krishna tells us in Bhagavad Gita, how do we bridle the senses? Through sharpening our intelligence. Sharpening our intelligence. So that's one aspect that we can implement in our life. And those intelligence is sharpened by the torchlight of the transcendental knowledge. And that is in Bhagavatam. When we hear Bhagavatam, when we read Bhagavatam, our senses get purified and they will create less troubles in our life. Hmm? The second analogy of an animal given most of the time, or reptile given, is the snake. Is the snake a reptile? Whatever, wriggling, you know, a snake. That's an animal species. So the snake, you know, the, the snake has got this poisonous fang, you know, and if the snake bites, then the poison will spread in the body. So Prabhupada says in his purport that if we don't control our senses, they will inject <laughs> Prabhupada uses this word actually. If you don't control our senses, the senses will inject venomous, poisonous into your body and that will lead to the pitfall of your spiritual journey. So what we can do is defang the snake. No? Because all the, 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 the snake is very, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, very ferocious. If you defang the snake, then the snake is harmless, although you know, it is still poisonous. It is still poisonous. But it will not bother you because it just can't bite you anymore. So he said we defang our senses. How do we do it? The way we do it is because, you know, our, our problem is not so much we are in the material body. Hmm? That is not our problem. Our problem is more because our senses are knotted to the three modes of the material nature. And the three modes of the material nature make us dance like a puppet and sometimes pull us in goodness, sometimes in passion, and sometimes in ignorance, but in all the times in the three modes, giving us some attraction, whether in goodness is also an attraction or also in ignorance. So the problem is our senses are noted to the three modes of the material nature. And that is at the stage when the jiva is actually you know, in the material world in one sense. Because the jiva gets this material body, but the bewilderment happens when he's tied to the three modes of the material nature. So how to get rid of it is to cut those three knots that are attached to the three modes of the material nature and have only one knot to, of the senses and tie it to Krishna. In that way the senses will not bother us. So it's all about cutting. Cut, cut, cut. Cut the three knots, which is very, very hard. So I'm, you know, I'm speaking from a theoretical point of view. You know, I'm, not, I'm not even close to being mastering any of this. Is that we cut the three knots and tie the knot to Krishna and we will be... All right, because at any point in time, you know, especially for sadhakas like us, our senses are being pulled towards two things. At any point in time, our senses are being pulled towards two things. One are the sense objects for our sensual pleasure, and second towards Krishna as well, that we want to continue our journey in saving Krishna. As sadhakas, we have got developed this much of attraction towards Krishna for sure, that we are attracted to Krishna undoubtedly, you know that we are attracted to Krishna. But our problem is, we are not attracted only to Krishna. <laughs> we are also attracted to other, other things. Krishna, take us back to Godhead, but gently, gently, you know, little gently. Uh, no, let me just enjoy a little bit of material opulence as well. 
you know, we have to build a house, have a nice family, you know, some education, some money, and then when I'm about to retire, then you take me back to Godhead, but not immediately. No? We are not at that level. So we want best of the both, you know, at the moment. And, but we are trying our level best to be more towards this Krishna senses rather than uh, the material senses, sensual objects, yeah. So Prabhupada teaches us, therefore, that at any point in time when you are being pulled by these two senses, Krishna senses and let's say sen no, material objects, then to give in to the sense object is nonsense. <laughs> Giving to the sense object is nonsense. Don't do that. Don't do this nonsense business. Finish it off in this lifetime. And how do we do this? So whenever temptation comes, the best way to say no to temptation is to say yes to devotion. The best way to say no to temptation is to say yes to devotion. Because param drishtva nivartate. No? The senses, our material senses, our senses attachment to the material objects can be quietened down if it is given and fed higher taste. When there is higher taste, the lower taste will automatically go away. And that is the beauty of our, you know, of our, that's our philosophy, that we don't have to fight so much about worrying so much about the negatives. Just concentrate on the positives and we will be all right. Okay. So I will stop here. Uh, any questions, comments, corrections? Do we have a speaker? Uh, the, not the speaker, sorry, the microphone. So in uh, purport, Prabhupada is explaining about uh, different type of yogis and also devotees. And he gives an analogy of how one Viswamitra fell down just by, mm. uh, you know, I hearing tinkerbell sound also eyesight, seeing beautiful also smell, I think from Menaka. Yeah. Um, but of course, on the other hand, Prabhupada mentioning that devotees, uh, you know, they are more attracted to Krishna. They cannot easily fall down. Uh, of course, sometimes uh, those who are in the beginning stage, Kanista, Madhyama, you know, they might uh, get attracted or fall down. But however, those who are behind these modes of material as you said, so they, they cannot easily fall down. Okay. Of course, we have got best examples of uh, um, Namacharya, yeah. uh, Haridas Thakur. I think uh, with uh, yogic practice, so they are focused so much on tip of uh, nose, uh, still, you know, uh, this vision, you can see what is happening. Mm. But whereas devotees like uh, uh, Haridas Thakur, so he's chanting, so he has a goal that I have to chant these many rounds and then I will consider. But whereas uh, uh, yogis, they probably do not have that goal. Okay, I have to meditate for, you know, 10,000 years till mm. then, you sit down there. Mm. If they follow that approach, then there is chance that they might, uh, you know, transform. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it seems like uh, devotee's approach is uh, easy and there is a goal for a day, yeah. goal for a hour, then um, so by the time day is over, then you can postpone. So therefore you keep postponing, then they will become stale. Hmm. So no more attractive either to the object or to the person. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You said a, that was a comment, not a question, right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you can No, no, that's fine. I think you said it right. Except for, you know, maybe just one, one minor thing that I picked up is that when Haridas Thakur told the prostitute to wait, it is not because he said, you know, that uh, I have got my rounds to chant and, and then I will consider you. It's not, that's not what is, that's not what the case is. The case is more so, you know, he teaches that if somebody comes to you with their, you know, if somebody comes to a devotee with their problems, first we have to understand their problem, you know, we don't reject their problems. This is, you know, an art of preaching, you know. You, you hear their problems, you accept their problems, that yes, it is a problem, and then I will give you a solution, no? if you have come to me for, with your problem. So they are what no, uh, Aridas Thakur is teaching us, is that when the prostitute comes to him with her problem, that he, she wants a sensual enjoyment, no? he says that, okay, I can hear you, yep, that's your problem, uh, and I will give you the solution. And what is the solution? Harinam yanu kirtanam. So I will chant, and that is the solution for your problem, just by hearing this mantra, I know you will get purified. So he's got that strong conviction that by chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra will solve her problem. So it's, he makes her sit down there for Krishna Katha, which is Krishna Nama Katha, 
no? And that Nama Katha will fix you. Not that, you know, it's that I have to do my chanting, you know, not like that. No? It's, a, it's a different mindset, yeah, when we, uh, the way he dealt with that problem of the prostitute by giving her Krishna Nama Katha, you know, like that. So, so in our case, yes, you know, we, uh, we have to just follow the instructions of the spiritual master at the beginning stages when, you know, to curb the senses because he says, you know, follow four regulative principles and you will be all right, you know, in the sadhana bhakti stage. So we just follow the principles of the other instructions of the spiritual master, you know. Uh, but when we get more mature in our Krishna consciousness, then, you know, then we start, then that becomes our culture rather than compliance, you know. At the moment, we try to curb our senses with compliance to the spiritual master's instructions. But eventually it will become a culture of us, you know, just doesn't matter, you know, I'm not attracted. And we can see that, especially in my case, I know that uh, I come from the background of, let's say, meat eating. But I don't need a spiritual master's instructions in the moment not to eat meat. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, that's just so gross. You know, whenever, not that we go to Safeway too much these days, it's all online. But, you know, when things are open, when we walk into the supermarket, you know, it's like the smell is so foul. You know, sometimes I, we don't even buy things that is near to the area where the meat is being sold. So it just goes away, you know, it just goes away. Uh, but some other senses, of course, you know, uh, is always more difficult uh, for, for, for a lot of us, you know. Uh, but eventually, yeah, you know, so, so Lord Vishnu also tells Brahma, you know, in the Chatus Loki Bhagavatam, the same thing, that, yep, you know, the highest perfection is Prema Bhakti. Hmm? Uh, but to get to that, you know, you start with Sadhana Bhakti, you know, Anvya Vyati Rekabhyam Yat Sayat Sarvatra Sarvada, you know, that in all places, times, all time, places and circumstances, do sadhana bhakti and that practice makes perfect. So the perfect vision is what? To see Krishna everywhere. Inside, yata mahanti bhutani bhute su chava cheshvanu pravishthani ya pravishthani tata teshuna teshvaham, you know, that I'm inside and I'm outside. And to be able to see Krishna inside and outside, bahir narshima hirde narshima, inside and outside, we need to be, have that perfect vision, and that is called Prema Bhakti. A devotee sees Krishna everywhere. But how do we get to that perfection? By practice. And what is that practice? The practice is that Yat Sayat Sarvatra Sarvada. You know, at every time, place, and circumstances, we uh, save the Lord. You know, we inquire. Etad Etad Eva Jignyasam Tatva Jignyasu Atmana Anvaya Vyati Rekabhyam Yat Sayat Sarvatra Sarvada. We should inquire. And the highest principle, the epitome of en all inquiry is to inquire about the absolute truth, tattva, tattva jignyasu atmana, by directly or indirectly, by other processes or by bhakti, in all time, place and circumstances, and then you'll get that perfect vision of able to see Krishna everywhere. And then, no, it's not so much about following the instructions of the spiritual master at that time, it is just, yep, no, we are at that stage, but that is, that is some time away, you know, and we have to work hard to get there. To be able to really understand the purports of the spiritual master takes some time. Hmm? And Lord Ram again demonstrated. I'll finish with that sweet pastime. Yeah, we have got five minutes, so I'll finish with that sweet pastime. Hmm? In the and I heard this from Amanandra Prabhu, so I'll repeat. He said that in the case of Lord Ram, you no, know, when uh, when the swamber was being arranged and Lord Ram has to break the oh, somebody has to break the air the bow, Lord Shiva's bow, uh, to be able to be eligible to marry Mother Sita, then you know. In that, you know, in that scene, you know, a lot of powerful kings are there and Kshatriyas are there and they can't even shake the bow a little bit, what to speak about breaking it. And then, you know, at the end when nobody is able to move the bow even to a micro inch, then uh, Lord Ram, um, Vasistha Muni, right? He was with Vasistha Vishwamitra, Vishwamitra, na? So Vishwamitra glanced at Lord Ram and said, Ram, see the bow. So that's what he said, see the bow. No? Now in that context, no, if you are a student to the caliber of Lord Ram, when the spiritual master is saying, see the bow, what does it actually mean? <laughs> it means in that context, you have to understand the purport of the, the spiritual master's instruction. No? So there, you know, knowing that the whole occasion is to break the bow, to be able to be Mary Mother Sita, knowing that nobody has been able to do it, so when Vishwamitra is saying that, it was Shiva Vishwamitra, right? Not, not Vasistmani? Vishwamitra. So when Vishwamitra said that, look at the bow, Lord Ram, no, Lord Ram, look at the bow, Lord Ram understands the purport of the spiritual master's instruction and knows that his duty is to get up, 
go and see the bow and break the bow. And marry Mother Sita. No, all the consequence of it comes as a package. No, in one instruction. One instruction means instruction is not to see the bow. Actually, the purport of the instruction is to marry Mother Sita. <laughs> and but you start from here. All are these minor minor steps to get to that stage of marrying Mother Sita. But a student who is not at the level of you no know, Lord Ram, what will he think? He will see. Okay, my spiritual, my Gurudev, Guru Maharaj has said, go and see the bow. I'll get up, go and see the bow, and come back and sit down. Gurudev. I have seen the bow. You know, this is second class intelligence. You know, worse than that is the third class intelligence. Guru Maharaj says, Shishya, student, please go and see the bow. Third class intelligence reactions will be, yeah, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going very soon. Just give me five minutes. In five minutes, I will go and see the bow. Not now, because I'm just busy with somebody else. Just give me five minutes, Guru Maharaj, I'll go and see the bow. Third class intelligence. Fourth class intelligence, you know, Guru Maharaj says, Shishya, student, Please go and see the bow. Why do I have to go? Why can't you go and see it? <laughs> Why are you asking me to go and see the bow? You please go and see it for yourself. <laughs> oh, if you want, I can show you the bow on you know, some video call. You know, everything is now on Zoom. We can't travel anywhere. So everything is coming on Zoom and, you know, and, and WebEx and all that. So I will show you the bow, turn on your video. I'll put a webcam there and you see the bow you know, on, your, on your video call. So this is the fourth class laziness. You know? You told me to see the bow, I'm not going to go. You go and see it. It's your problem, not mine. The first class intelligence, Lord Ram demonstrates that the master's, spiritual master says, see the bow, the purport is to marry Mother Sita. No? Go and do everything else all together. So we are like that. At the moment, you know, it's like, why are those four regulatory principles there, you know? Why can't we, you know, we eat chocolate, you know? Why can't we eat a little bit of karmi bread, you know? Why can't we do all these things, you know? Uh, but eventually all this taste will go away, you know, eventually. So there is big hope for us, yeah? Senses will eventually be conquered through Krishna's mercy. Okay, we will definitely stop here, now. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai.